Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us a former Air Force pilot, Rajiv Tyagi with us. You were in NDA, you passed out in 1977. And you, you flew a MiG to MiG aircraft. Yes, I've, I've flown MiG-21 uh, aircraft. See, there is a, not only a war frenzy, but there is also this belief that air arm is going to solve the problem of various kinds. And this seems to have uh, been the reason of claiming this, this major strike that we have that we have done in Balakot. So what do you think of this air operation? Can you get terrorism on the real terrorism? कह रहे हैं अखबारों में या टेलीविजन चैनल्स में देखिए जहां तक आर्म फोर्स का सवाल है चाहे वो आर्मी हो नेवी हो एयरफोर्स हो ऑल थ्री आर एट द कमांड ऑफ द पॉलिटिकल एस्टैब्लिशमेंट और जैसा पॉलिटिकल एस्टैब्लिशमेंट चाहेगी आर्म फोर्सेस ऑफ द यूनियन विल परफॉर्म अकॉर्डिंग टू दैट नाउ वी कम टू uh, tackling terrorism for example tackling terrorism is not something it is an asymmetric war Terrorism, using terrorism as a, an instrument of state policy uh, is an asymmetric war. And we've seen that Pakistan has stopped using conventional warfare uh, after 1971. After 1971, their deep state, I would say, uh, the ISI, um, uses, uses terror as an instrument of state policy because this is a very cheap um, army to maintain. You don't have to train them. You don't have to uh, give them a good salary. You don't have to maintain their uniforms. You don't have to um, pay them a pension. So using terror as an instrument of state policy is probably the cheapest kind of uh, armed force that you can uh, use. And I would say terror by virtue of the fear that it instills in humans and the disruption it causes in uh, civil society has a disproportionate um, claim over our consciousness. Political impact is much higher than yes. the amount of people, number of uh, people, people killed. killed. And that we know yeah. even on the United, in the United States, the so-called war on terror. In fact, the number of people killed, as you said, in road accidents is far higher than was killed by or has been killed by any acts yes. of terror. So now we come to how do we tackle terror? Now, terror organizations are run by individuals. They're run by a clique. They are run by a small group of people whose business is basically to brainwash a whole lot of uh, young people, uh, young people uh, using religion, using ideology, using various um, other techniques uh, into giving up their lives. Now, how do we deal with this? As we know, Pakistan consists of actually three states within one. We have the civilian establishment, uh, just like ours. We have an elected government. We have parliament. We have uh, uh, legislation going on uh, through the year. Uh, and we have elections. They have the same. That is one establishment. The second establishment there is the army. The army claims disproportionate part of Pakistan's existence, its daily life, its uh, budgets. And even runs a lot of the industry. Uh, it so it even runs industry. Whereas in India, the armed forces are completely subservient to the government of the day. The third establishment in Pakistan is the deep state engaged with the terror framework. Now, the terror framework, I don't think the way we are going about it, there is a frenzy of war. If we want to tackle the terror framework, we must have the wherewithal to do it. We have to create a three-dimensional force that is able to address those individuals who are running these terror networks. Russia has turned this into a fine art. They're able to target individuals anywhere across the planet and uh, execute them. Let us say Pakistan carried out Pulwama. Let us say the Pakistan state carried out Pulwama. But remember, they still have deniability. They still carry plausible deniability by saying that, no, we didn't carry this out. But then 
we went in all guns blazing and we have uh, um, every every member of the government is giving statements uh, there is a frenzy of uh, war on television channels so ultimately we ourselves have denied ourselves a uh, plausible deniability as you said this asymmetric war so we have responded asymmetrically by using our air force in a war in which the air force does it have that kind of role that was really the yes, question was, we need to yes i was coming to, to that but uh, you know to come to whether the air force can actually tackle this kind of a situation we need to understand uh, you know the roles of uh, all these all these uh, simple yes. parts now what is a terror organization i mean uh, it's not something like uh, our air headquarters or army headquarters or naval headquarters there, there's no building there there's no there are no office bearers there are no people who are in uniform walking in and out of that place that you can go and bomb that with uh, precision um, targeting mm -hmm. it could just be a run down tin shed uh, somewhere in the in the in the forests uh, it could be a tent and uh, there might be three or four people who are under training and uh, after their training is over somebody just approaches the tent and walks away so how do we target how do we target uh, terrorists we certainly cannot target terrorists with a bomb run now why did we do it i'm certain that this has been done with an eye to publicity and it is feeding a frenzy that is already present in the public i don't know where the figures of 300 or 350 uh, terrorists killed came from where do you think those 350 terrorists were hiding would there be 350 terrorists is terrorist a profession it's not you could find 350 officers of the armed forces in one location what is the meaning of finding 350 terrorists in one location but assuming supposing the 350 people who were there we don't know whether they're really terrorists or not assuming there's a jesh mohammed camp over there even with all these assumptions is it possible in a bombing run of this type to know what the actual damage or the casualties have been well let's say let's say the 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 attack was in the daytime it was in daylight we can think of a reconnaissance aircraft following the strike actually taking photographs of the damage and assessing uh, being able to assess the damage later but if we say that the that the raid took place at 3:45 am then certainly there, there's no way of even um, a reconnaissance or photo reconnaissance of the area to um, to establish uh, how much of damage has taken place so the figures would be in that sense which are being bandied about really have no basis shall we say on evidence that we could have seen from air. Uh, yes i mean at least i cannot think how this evidence could be collected if uh, there is a method and um, if there is a way in which uh, this was done uh i'm sure everybody would like to know how this was done how it was how this estimate of 300 or 350 uh, came about of course let's not get into the what pakistan is saying that they said that one somebody injured a few structures damage trees fell and so on assuming that we don't we cannot as sitting here verify either set of claims let's look at the other issue there has also been this argument that hey we showed our prowess by getting 80 kilometers and doing an action how easy or difficult is it for aircraft with either side to go and do this kind of action because today pakistan claims it has done some action we have claimed that this didn't happen we chased them away and yes one aircraft has uh, landed or crashed in pakistan but leaving that aside as the facts of the case may be leaving that aside how easy or difficult is it for each other's air force or the kind of aircraft you have to penetrate each other's air space see increasingly over the years both sides have upgraded their air defense systems uh, we have better and better air defense systems uh, we have uh, airborne warning and control systems uh, which consists of uh, radar systems mounted on aircraft um, and these aircraft patrol along the border so with 
with AVACS kind of aircraft, we are able to uh, administer and control a very vast area, vast geographical area in the sense of being able to uh, see the theater. The theater. Be able to watch the theater and see uh, threats coming in. That having been said, it is very difficult because um, fighters that are coming in to attack uh, a target would be coming in at 30 to 50 meters above the ground at something close to 900 to 1,000 kilometers an hour. Actually locking onto a target at that altitude, at that height above the ground, and uh, tracking it, and then launching uh, a weapon to, to uh, destroy that target is a very, very difficult uh, thing. And it, it's, it's a lot of it's just luck. I mean, your air defense system has to be within a certain cone of operation for it uh, to be effective uh, with, with a target that's moving at such high speed and so close to the ground. Uh, in most cases, um, we assume that anyone that's taken off uh, um, to hit a target is certainly going to reach the target. And uh, doctrinaire, one can only, uh, one can only hope to uh, enforce a regime of such high attrition that um, we ensure that an attacker never goes back, thereby uh, imposing a very high cost to adventure. Right? But to say that uh, you know we can create such an environment that nobody will be able to enter our airspace or to offer the other side to claim a similar thing, I think is just a, a little over the top. You know. The other issue that comes up, both sides are nuclear powers. Both sides have the capability to fight a limited war. It's not, it's going to be a long drawn out war, war in which India's, shall we say, strategic strength will then be proved over Pakistan. We are talking about one week, two weeks, and even that's very dangerous given nuclear weapons. Do you think this kind of saber rattling, rattling this kind of war hysteria, and you've talked about it earlier, makes any sense or it is actually, there is a necessity to bring down the temperature and talk diplomacy. Well, I, think, I think it's uh, the prime responsibility of a government, of a responsible government, uh, is, to, is to calm down uh, public tenor. Uh, today we're seeing, um, very unfortunately, uh, we're seeing uh, retired generals um, Baying for blood and for war. I think uh, a soldier is a professional. Uh, is a professional, and uh, it's strange to see soldiers baying for war. All of us, as a nation, not as uh, you and me or followers of any particular ideology, but um, as Indians, I think we need to be more mature. We need to see what damage we're going to do to ourselves. Forget the damage you're going to do to anyone else. Let's say you even finish them off completely from the face of the earth. What damage are you going to do to yourself? Worry about yourself first. Yes, it's a, it's a very, very unfortunate scenario. We who are supposed to have given the message of peace to the world, how to conduct politics, including independent struggle peacefully and now thinking of converting everything to war and force that that's the only language you seem no, to be seem to be I, I I read an interesting um, uh, quote uh, someone said on social media that throughout world history um, humans have celebrated the end of war this is perhaps the first time we are celebrating the start of a war I mean uh, this is shall we say coming from an ex-soldier, and I think this is what most soldiers who have seen war would say, that war is not what is desirable. It is when everything else fails that nations go to war. And in this particular case, we seem to be trying to find solutions militarily, which are really political issues. Yes, if, uh, if a nation, uh, to my thinking, if a nation goes to war, it means uh, its entire edifice of politics and legislation and parliament and elections and uh, everything, the entire structure of the state has completely failed. Only then it... Only then you go to war. war. And of course, in this case, there is also the proximity of the elections, unfortunately, because a lot of the leaders are linking military action to 
the results of the elections and who people should vote for. So the game is obvious, but that is a small game compared to the much bigger one of war between two nuclear powers. Yes, uh, that is true. I, um, a, a lot of people on social media are uh, commenting, including me, who are commenting on uh, the possibility that um, that this war mongering uh, may be connected uh, to uh, to the coming elections, and all the more reason why the government needs to exercise restraint and needs to calm down the frenzy for war. You know that we're seeing on uh, television channels. Uh, or, or very soon we might turn into the first nation uh, that was driven to war by television. And social media. And social media. Thank you very much for being with us and we hope we'll be able to get you to discuss this and other issues. This is all the time we have for News Click today. Do keep watching News Click and other discussions.